Okay, well today we're taking a look at my Little Monster Delta 3D printer made by TiVo. This is a five-year review. I've had it five years. Five years ago I thought it was a good idea to get a large Delta printer. You know, sometimes you shouldn't get what you wish for. It's, um, it is large. It's so large that it, when I had it in the house it'd have to sit on the floor because it's over four foot tall before you put filament up on the top of it. And of course if it's on the floor then the build plate area clear down there by where you see that white hand would uh, get covered with dust and dog hair and get bumped by the dogs and on and on and on. I couldn't put it up on the counter because then it would hit the ceiling and getting down on the floor on my hands and knees to take prints on and off was a pain. So it ended up out here in, uh, in the workshop. This is the so-called clean room of the workshop. And um, didn't get used a whole lot. It got used, but not a whole lot. But I thought I'd just go over the fact that, uh, well, not the fact, what I mods I had done through the years and that, that it's still working and it's still just an excellent printer. It's just really big and it's all metal. You need a hand cart to move it around. It is too heavy to pick up and move without a hand cart. And uh, you need it on a little bench like I have here. Let's see. So you can see now I have this kind of short bench thing. Something very sturdy. Actually, I think it used to be a dog grooming bench. And uh, that gives it just about the right height so you can get to the bottom. I can get to the top to put filament on it. And uh, what I ran last night... I'm moving you. I'm moving you. Hang on. What I ran last night was this... Uh, hand, the Adams Family hand, it, or whatever it was, and uh, haven't taken it off the build plate yet. It is still secured rather well. So I thought I'd try to uh, bust that off without damaging the bed if possible. Got to get enough room for me to get in there. So normally what I like to do is take a uh, flat blade razor and kind of use it like a shoehorn. If I can get that started, then I know I won't be digging into the uh, build plate. And there's nothing on this build plate. This is a, a build tack type material. And then I got this antique spatula flipping thing. And I like the antique ones because they're, they're so thin and flexible. It's like feeler gauge material. They work really well for getting things up off like that. So you see I got the hand loose and get the uh, little piece that printers always put around. There we go. And so it's a really cool slightly larger than life size hand with lots of detail. If I'd had flush tone paint uh, filament that would have been even better. But uh, just for Halloween why not do the it hand? There's other versions of this you can find online where they've hollowed out the stub to put pens and pencils and stuff in there. Ah, back to the printer. Um, through the years one of the there's, there's really only two complaints that I had about the, the printer, and in, in this case the heated bed is AC heated, so it heats up really fast, and it'll, it, it'll get really hot, but um, it doesn't really heat all the way out. It doesn't, this part out here doesn't get heated, so everything from here, you know, around in, a smaller diameter area, heats up to the proper, in my case I print at 60 uh, degrees Celsius to make things adhere to this build tack type surface and um, if it's a really large parts that are coming all the way out to the end and large parts of course always tend to want to warp more because there's more flat surface area so once they get out to the cold part then it's a problem so if you're doing something really large it goes clear out to the edge and you might have to use glue stick that last uh, inch or two out here to assure that you get adhesion but otherwise it sticks really well uh, on the inside part. And what else? That was one of the things I didn't like. Oh, the other thing is that uh, 
back when this came out, it didn't come with a filament sensor. So I've always wanted uh, a filament sensor to, in case you run out. Because if you've got a printer this big, that means you're doing big prints. And if you're doing big prints, then that means there's a good chance you're going to run out of filament. You don't want to have to be standing there and watch it. So that's one thing I wished it always had, had come with was a filament sensor. And I wish that the AC heating bed had gone completely 100% all the way to the outside edges. Now, problems that I had, and if you, uh, I'll try to remember to put links down below, because I, I did a couple of videos, I don't know, four, four or five years ago on, uh, on this. And one of the problems I always had is they had this designed originally with what they called a floating or flying extruder. This extruder, if you're not a 3D printer person, is what pushes the filament into the hot end. And they had theirs flying where these strings that you see, it's not strings, it's actually belt material. They had tethered to the tops. Here, I can move this down. Well, let me turn it off. It's over here on this big power supply. There we go. There we go. So normally, if this was down here, this extruder they had it was called a flying one, and it would tether from the slots that you see in these tops of the effector rods, and it would hang down about, I don't know, six or so inches up above the extruder head, and it would hang in here. And because these arms don't move linearly, I mean with each other, they move separately, that would mean that, that sometimes those belt hanging things would be really tight, sometimes they'd be loose, so they put little spring things on them, and it was really hokey, and this uh, motor is the heaviest thing out here, it's heavier than the rest of all that, and so that's slinging around, and pulling, and bouncing, and so what I had happen more than once is the fitting, where the tube is that connects between the hot end and the extruder, the fitting itself would break, and once that broke, the extruder would keep running if you're doing a print all night, pushing out filament, which couldn't get pushed into the hot end because the tube is no longer connected. The connection between the hot end and the extruder has to be absolute. Can't have any slop or play because you're trying to force filament down in there to get melted to come out the hot end. And uh, once that breaks in, it would just keep spooling the filament out on the floor and you'd come in the morning and find a roll of filament on the floor. The good thing about that is it wasn't turned into spaghetti. It wasn't like the printer was printing in air and pushing it through here. I could just spool it back up. The bad thing is, though, it happened to me twice, and at that point I went, this is stupid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to put an end to that. So I ended up taking the extruder off of there and, and tethering it to some bolt heads that are already... See, this is, this is solid metal. <laughs> quarter inch thick, uh, tethering it up here where it sits and just using a slightly longer tube that's called a Bowden tube and um, haven't had a problem since. It works works great this way, still prints great this way. It doesn't being slung around and influencing um, the head or anything like that. Uh, also a problem with the original setup was that once a print was done and it lifts up the way you saw it here, let's lift it back up. In the end, it homes, and that's home position. Uh, when this was being held onto the tops of the effector arms, that added this weight to this, and when it would finish the print and go up and home, then all the stepper motors would turn off. It would sink back down. It would go well the end is still hot so if you weren't there when it sunk back down you were basically digging the hot end of the uh, extruder mechanism there right into the part that you just made. Now that problem could have been fixed by changing the uh, end G code. G code is what you feed into this thing to make it know what to do and you could put in a command that tells the stepper motors to stay on even after the print is finished, which once it goes up it would lock and stay. But since I already knew I wasn't happy with the, uh, the thing flying here and slinging around and breaking and pulling these fittings apart, I went, I don't need to worry about that. I'm just going to go ahead and 
move it up and it hasn't been a problem so that's worked great so a little monster it is a monster it does fantastic prints oh what else way back in the day if you've been in a printing for a while if you remember back five years ago uh, TL smoothers were all the big thing. See, they didn't have as many different uh, stepper drivers as they do now. Now they've got stepper drivers that micro step and sense the current draw, so you don't even need to put end stop switches anymore. If something jams, it senses it and knows that's the end of travel. Anyway, they have all kinds of fancy things now that they didn't have back then. And so some people were claiming on their uh, Delta printers and TiVos. Well, in other printers too, they'd have something called salmon skin, which was a a, a funny, a funny look to the finish of the uh, item you're printing. I never really had that problem. My TV always worked fine, but since it was all a rage and they were dirt cheap, I went ahead and bought the TL smoothers and and crammed them uh, up inside the control box. And they're just a a simple inline uh, little. PC board that basically goes between where the stepper motors plug into the board and the board and and all they really are is a diode pack they're basically inducing a dead band voltage um, on the stepper motors and for some reason that's supposed to help the printing I could never uh, figure out from an electrical standpoint how that would help the printing but I also could see that it shouldn't hurt anything and it shouldn't stop the steppers from working it's only inducing like a, a volt to maybe a volt and a half voltage drop in both directions, whether it's positive or negative, to the stepper motors. And it shouldn't make any difference on a 24 volt system like this if we've reduced the voltage that small amount. And for some reason that's supposed to have improved. Well, you can find all kinds of videos on YouTube about it, people claiming how that improved the print quality. But... Um, I didn't have a print quality question. I just jumped on that bandwagon because they were dirt cheap and everybody was saying it was the thing to do. So I did it. And I figured if I didn't like it, I'd just unplug them because I didn't have to break anything to try it. So they're stuffed in there too. So the only real mods that uh, that I've made to the thing were adding teal smoothers and, and uh, undoing their flying extruder and anchoring it. And... Uh, they used to try to claim that there it was a direct divide, drive system because this is about where it would hang when it was flying. And they would still have to have a Bowden tube from here to here. Well, if you've got a Bowden tube, I don't care if it's six inches longer, or in my case, if it's longer, it's still a Bowden tube. You're still not direct drive. These days, you can get all kinds of really nice new uh, hot ends that are super lightweight. The uh, stepper motor is not so big. You could actually go in with a direct drive if you really wanted to direct drive a no Bowden right on this head and it would work just fine. But this works just fine. This doesn't cost me any money. And uh, there it is, five years later, still an absolutely wonderful 3D printer. Quality's great, works every time, now that the tubes can't blow apart. And um, like I say, Careful what you wish for, you might just get it. In the case of this, I got a really large Delta printer that's so big and heavy that uh, I can't move it around and I have to keep it out here in the cold, cold shop to uh, work its magic. TiVo, little monster, Delta printer, five years later, still an excellent, excellent printer.